The Roman statesman and philosopher Marcus Cicero called Saturn Phinon, a word meaning shining. Saturn is where we get our name for Saturday, and Saturnalia was probably the most popular festival of the Roman calendar, characterized by revelry and orgy. Jupiter was called the son of Saturn. The tale of Zeus or Jupiter and Kronos or Saturn is quite well known. Kronos, who had castrated his own father, Uranus, with a sickle, swallowed all his children by Rhea as soon as they were born for fear that one would overthrow him. That was until Rhea contrived to smuggle the infant Zeus away. He grew up on Mount Ida, suckled by a goat, and grew up to overthrow his father. Saturn, with his sickle, was associated with the harvest, the passing of seasons, of a timeless era of plenty and bounty before time, a golden age. His devouring of his children taken as an allegory for the passing of generations. That Zeus was spared this fate of being devoured can be interpreted as his generation not being devoured by time, but instead everlasting, like the evergreen tree used now as the Christmas tree, green year-round. Christmas being the modern version of Saturnalia, the traditional time of rebirth and renewal, when the shortest day of the year and the longest night is passed after the winter solstice, and the days start becoming longer again. The solar year is reborn, like a phoenix, or later, the eagle, the sign of Jupiter, the planet that has a 12-year cycle passing through the 12 houses of, or constellations of the zodiac. Saturn takes 28 to 30 years to complete a full cycle. Because Saturn is a symbol of wisdom which grows with age, its cycle has been seen as particularly important in reflecting our development. Every seven years, Saturn completes a quarter of the cycle and we move into a new stage of awareness. The renewal of light and the coming of the year was celebrated in the Roman Empire as the Deus Natilis of Sol Invictus or the birthday of the unconquerable sun on December 25th. In the Northern Hemisphere during late December, the days are at their shortest lengths and the nights are at their longest. For those of the pagan world, this has always been the greatest time of the year to celebrate and practice the works of darkness. The pagan calendar identifies this period as the winter solstice. It was during the pre-Christian midwinter pagan celebrations of Scandinavia's Norsemen where today's Christmas traditions began. As a means of honoring the pagan sex and fertility god Yule, a 12-day celebration during the month of December was inaugurated. A large single log considered to be a phallic idol was lit on fire and kept burning for 12 days. Animal or human sacrifices were offered in the fire on each of those days. Wild, delirious reveling accompanied the daily sacrifices as drunken participants defiantly strove to make contact with spirits. A thousand miles away in pre-Christian Rome, celebrants were paying homage to their own gods during the winter solstice. Witchcraft traditions hold that a number of pagan gods were given birth during this period, including Dionysus, Attis, and Baal, chief male god of fertility and licentiousness. Another pagan god from Persia, identified as Mithra, was said to have been born specifically on December 25th. Mithra was the god of the unconquerable sun, the god of the light between heaven and earth, worshipped at that time by an influential Roman cult. His birth symbolized an end to the long nights and a return to the dominance of the sun. During the month-long winter solstice celebration, courts in Rome were closed. Any and all crimes were allowed. 
Homosexuality, cross-dressing, and uncontrolled debauchery reigned supreme. Rome's order was turned upside down. Even children were allowed to join in the drunken orgies as part of the juvenilia celebration. By 270 AD, the Roman Emperor Aurelian had made it official, setting aside a seven-day period from December the 17th through the 24th, culminating in an exchange of gifts on December the 25th to celebrate the birth of the sun god. This Roman orgy to end all orgies later became known as Saturnalia, in honor of the god Saturn, the god of excess. Roman soldiers invading Britain brought with them their pagan orgiistic traditions. Upon taking root in England, Saturnalia became known as the Festival of Fools reigned over by the Lord of Misrule. By the fourth century, the influential government-sanctioned Church of Rome, unable to outlaw the growing number of pagan practices, chose instead to adopt them into their so-called official Christianity. The Church believed this would attract more pagans to their fold. Up until this time, the birthday of Jesus Christ, the Jewish Messiah, had not been celebrated at all. Ignoring scriptures, however, indicating that the birth probably did not occur during the winter, the church nevertheless confused biblical history and made Jesus' birthday coincide with the pagan god Mithra. The birth date of the sun god had now become the birth date of the son of God. It was hoped that the pagan celebrations of Saturnalia would merge into this new legally sanctioned form of Christianity. The church's practice of changing the dates of Christian events to coincide with pagan festivals continued, and by the 7th century, Pope Gregory I had ordered Augustine of Canterbury to incorporate any and all pagan practices and customs into the expanding Roman Catholic Church. During the Middle Ages, the debased Mardi Gras atmosphere of what was now known as Christ's Mass had reached a fevered pitch. Common practices included open sex in the streets, rioting, murder, and a number of pagan druidic Halloween rituals. This blood-drenched celebration got so out of hand that by 1652, following the execution of King Charles I, Christ's Mass was finally outlawed in England. A religious reform movement began sweeping the country led by Puritan Oliver Cromwell. The Puritans took the biblical mandate seriously, which commanded that Christianity remain pure and separate from paganism. Despite their noble efforts, the celebration simply went underground, and by 1656, after only four short years under the ban, the public's demand for the legalization of Christ's Mass had become insurmountable. The appointment of Charles II to the throne restored England's monarchy and with it the celebration of Christ's Mass. The Puritans had lost England, but they held high hopes for the new world. Following England's lead in 1659, the colonies of America had likewise outlawed Christmas. For 200 years, the clergy in New England battled to keep the riotous celebrations honoring the pagan god Saturn from infiltrating the new world. The Reverend Cotton Mather had warned in a Christmas Day sermon in 1712, Can you in your conscience think that your Holy Savior is honored by hard drinking, lewd reveling, and by a mass fit for none but Borcus or Saturn? But the public's taste for sin and revelry persisted. In 1828, gang rioting during the Saturnalia-like Christmas celebrations got so bad that cities such as New York were forced to institute a professional police force for the first time in order to control the savagery. Christmas was not only not widely celebrated, in many cases, uh, many places, Christmas celebrations were actually outlawed. By the mid-19th century, American churches were the last remaining holdout in the war against the validation of Christmas. However, they too finally succumbed as a result of the efforts of the American Sunday School Society, who began advocating Christmas programs for children as a method of filling the pews. The Society argued that children could be taught about the birth of Christ through the reenactment of the Nativity. They also offered candy and treats to the children as a means of enticing families into accepting the holiday 
despite its notorious history and blatantly pagan roots. The successful technique of bribing children with candy would later be used on an unsuspecting American populace in the effort to promote the acceptance of the pagan rituals of Halloween. However, it was the work of England's most popular writer, Charles Dickens, whose ghostly 1843 book, A Christmas Carol, cemented the Christmas holiday in the hearts of Americans forever. By 1875, the Puritans had been beaten, and by 1890, all American states had voted to make Christmas a legal holiday. Today's tradition of the Christmas Yule Log stems directly from the worship of the pre-Christian Scandinavian fertility god Yule. Another uh, good example of the um, pagan elements of Christmas is the whole concept of Yule and the Yule Log. The, uh, the very term is derived from uh, uh, the Norse god Yule, spelled J-U-L. And uh, uh, every year around Christmas time, uh, a huge log was uh, uh, cut down and uh, fashioned into a uh, fertility symbol and then burned uh, for 12 days. And on each successive day, a, a, a new sacrifice to the god Yule was performed uh, uh, in the fire, and a new sacrificial victim was uh, was burned to death. Uh, sometimes, but not always, these sacrificial victims were uh, human beings. Mistletoe, when used in the casting of Wiccan or Druidic spells, could render a woman helpless and open to sexual exploitation. This is where we get our custom of hanging mistletoe in doorways today, and if a woman is caught underneath, she may be kissed and must not resist. The fir tree, uh, the mistletoe, uh, all of these things uh, typically uh, are come from uh, uh, overtly uh, pagan traditions, uh, in, typically in, from Northern Europe, German, Norse, and uh, English. Likewise, evergreen trees have always represented sex and fertility in pagan cultures. During the winter solstice, trees would be chopped down, brought inside, set up, and decorated as idols for worship. The Christmas tree was regarded uh, as, a, as a sacred tree. Uh, the, uh, the pagans of northern Europe uh, t typically uh, worshipped trees. They uh, regarded trees uh, and groves as sacred. So uh, uh, the bringing of the uh, tree into the house would be a way of uh, bringing this uh, supernatural uh, source of blessing uh, into your home. That was that was the whole idea that there were there were spirits uh, who resided in the trees. In the Middle Ages, the tradition of the winter solstice Christmas tree primarily took root in Germany. During his reign, King George the First, himself of German extraction, brought the custom to Victorian England. German immigrants settling in Pennsylvania did the same in America during the early 1800s. The concept of Santa Claus has had a long and winding history with a number of diverse cultures contributing to the composite character we have today. Beginning once again in Scandinavia, Santa's original incarnation was in the form of Odin. Odin would travel the sky during the winter solstice deciding who would die and who would prosper. Most believers were frightened of this particular time of year. In England, Odin eventually evolved into Father Christmas, who crowned with sprigs of holly, traveled to the countryside getting roaring drunk as part of the Festival of Fools celebration. Frequently he would be accompanied by a horned goat, ironically the biblical symbol of those who reject the salvation of Jesus Christ. Recognized in various cultures as Krampus, Beelzebub, or Zwart Pete, Black Peter, this assistant of St. Nicholas is best known by his German name, Necht Ruprecht. Described as a hideous horned creature, the servant Ruprecht was a dark and sinister figure who stood in stark contrast to the saintly Nicholas. Somehow, Father Christmas's companion, the horned goat, had metamorphosized into the foreboding horned devil called Ruprecht. As St. Nicholas traveled from house to house, inquiring about the behavior of children, Ruprecht would drop candy and gifts down the chimney into the good children's shoes which had been placed there. It was from this story that we get our tradition of hanging stockings on the mantle at Christmas time. If able to recite a verse or demonstrate a skill for St. Nicholas, the child would receive a gift. 
if unable to remember a verse or if the child had been bad, he or she would receive a switch or a whip. Ruprecht also carried a large sack which he would frequently use to haul away the really bad boys and girls. 19th century writer Theodore Storm in his story about Necht Ruprecht even goes so far as to describe the switches given to the children by Ruprecht as tools to be used in sadomasochistic rituals. Numen is the Latin term for divinity or divine presence, divine will or divine mind. Kronos or Saturn was also seen as a universal Numen in certain esoteric interpretations which signifies the hidden called by Latin Deus Latius, the hidden God, or in other words, the occult principle of all things. According to Varro, an ancient Roman scholar and writer, and I quote, he that produceth out of himself the hidden seeds and forms of all things and swalloweth them up into himself again. From here we may enter into a deeper understanding of the ancient mysteries. Some of who we today call pagans believe God to be diffused throughout all things. Plato himself approved of worshipping the invisible God in the sun, moon, and stars as visible images. The Zohar explains the term Ein Sof as follows. And I quote, Before he gave any shape to the world, before he produced any form, he was alone, without form, and without resemblance to anything else. Who then can comprehend how he was before the creation? Hence, it is forbidden to lend him any form or similitude, or even to call him by a sacred name, or to indicate him by a single letter or a single point. Honorary 33rd degree Freemason Manly P. Hall said, and I quote, the Kabbalists conceive of the supreme deity as an incomprehensible principle to be discovered only through the process of eliminating, in order, all of its cognizable attributes. That which remains, when every knowable thing has been removed, is Ein Sof, the eternal state of being. Although indefinable, the absolute permeates all space. Abstract to the degree of inconceivability, Ein Sof is an unconditioned state of all things. Substances, essences, and intelligences are manifested out of the inscrutability of Ein Sof, but the Absolute itself is without substance, essence, or intelligence. Ein Sof was referred to by Kabbalists as the most ancient of all the ancients. It was always considered as sexless. Its symbol was a closed eye. According to the Kabbalah, Ein Sof Ur is the limitless light, an empty, black, silent void that expands itself into boundless proportions, filling itself with metaphysical substance various philosophers have named luminiferous ether, or an electromagnetic azoth. This liquid light substance is an invisible, electromagnetic, radiant energy, its vibratory emanations are far too subtle to be perceived by or through any of our dense senses. Being an invisible black light, 6,000 years ago the high priests of ancient Egypt declared, Behold, our God is a black God, too brilliant for mortal eyes. This might help to explain not only the black Osiris, but also the Black Madonna, the Black Kali, and other deities associated with darkness. That said, the White Osiris is the manifest physical universe we perceive and which the Bible calls Day. Modern physicists now declare physical substance fundamentally to be comprised of a light substance in vibration. 
They have yet to declare just what this light vibration might be, however. The smallest physical particle for years has been known as the quark. More recently, an even smaller particle has been revealed, and this science is labeled dark matter. Ein soft ur is that dark matter. The night or dark matter is the ocean of black liquid light, a living, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent substance permeating every aspect of all manifest and unmanifest levels of experience. It is absent nowhere, filling all space, filling mineral, vegetable, animal, human kingdoms, and kingdoms beyond. A continuing emanation, every point exudes its own light and life. Alchemists call this their universal first matter, universal mercury. This is the substance of creation from no thing. The Hindu equivalent to Ein Sof Ur is Mula Prakriti, the root matter. Alchemists from all periods have given it any number of different names, but the principle, one designation has always been simply water, but a permanent water. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an independent anthropologist and author. My books are published on Amazon.com. Please consider making a donation to Atlantean Gardens if you'd like to support my work. Thank you for sharing this video and subscribing if you haven't already. Please leave a comment and I will see you next time.